Welcome to the podcast of the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine. I'm Bob Akashrafi. Today is October 30th, 2023, and I'm speaking with Christopher Willoughby, who's the author of Masters of Health, Racial Science and Slavery in U.S. Medical Schools, published by the University of North Carolina Press. Thanks for joining us, Chris. Thank you for having me. Why don't we start with what you call the medical fraternity? Would you describe that community in the years leading up to the Civil War in the U.S.? And tell us how the political divide over slavery and abolition affected the medical fraternity. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And in a lot of ways, the emergence of a white male medical fraternity, in many ways like the fraternities we think of in colleges, is a central focus of the book and the force that enacts racial science and kind of white domination through medicine. So I'm going to give a quick definition, then work back through how that actual fraternity emerges, um, the social structures that change, and the implications of it. So the medical fraternity, I argue, is, is quite literally a culture of white male physicians across regions. So in this case, primarily the North and the South, but also what would be called the Old South, which includes the Midwest, but also states like Louisiana, Kentucky. And they developed a shared set of experiences through being educated in a medical school, which was relatively novel in this period compared to medical education in the 18th century. And especially when we put this in light of colonial spaces like the Americas, which had very few quote unquote regularly trained MDs in the 18th century, by the mid 19th century, this will be a large group with a unified set of ideas and shared principles and experiences. So let's work back. What came before the medical fraternity? So for much of the 18th century, most physicians trained as apprentices in a small town with their local physician. This meant that virtually every physician had a different education, a different set of local experiences, and was heavily shaped by the knowledge or lack thereof of their individual preceptor. And before 1765, there are no medical schools in the Americas, or at least no medical schools in the ways we understand them now in the Americas. And so virtually everyone was not extremely elite and went to Europe for training, would have been trained as an apprentice. And this leads to just an incredible diversity of thought, diversity of thought on disease transmission, diversity of thought on the meaning of race. As I argue in the book, by the 18th century, physicians are becoming kind of critical enlightenment figures in defining racial differences. We often forget that a figure like Linnaeus was a trained physician, another critical physician racial theorist in that period would have been Petrus Camper, who's more often known in medical textbooks for his anatomy breakthroughs than the invention of measuring facial angles. But in 1765, a significant change will occur. Physicians in Philadelphia will found a medical school for the College of Philadelphia. In 1767, physicians in New York will found the medical school that's a part of Columbia University, ultimately. And then 15 years or so later, physicians will found the Harvard Medical School. And then by the end of the 18th century, there are a few more medical schools founded, but only a couple of hundred students are educated and receive an MD in all of the 18th century. There will be an explosion of medical schools in the first half of the 19th century. In 1765, physicians founded a medical school in Philadelphia, which was the first regular medical school in the what would become the United States, of course. This is 11 years before the Declaration of Independence is signed. Two years later, physicians in New York would found another medical school as a part of what becomes Columbia University. And then approximately 15 years later, physicians in Boston will found the Harvard Medical School. In the 18th century, almost all medical schools are confined to the Northeast, and only a little more than 200 students receive an MD in the 18th century. The pace of growth of the medical profession will rapidly increase in the first half of the 19th century, to such a point to where at the lead up of the Civil War around 1860, there are approximately 50 medical schools in the United States. They're often opening and being founded and then closed, so it's hard to get an exact number. But also in the two decades leading up to the Civil War, a little less than 30,000 MDs are produced. So that goes from 200 in the 18th century to nearly 30,000. And now mind you, throughout this entire period, 
African Americans are excluded from medical education to the point to where maybe less than 10 receive an MD in US medical schools. And this is only at the end in the last decade or so of the period we're talking about. Women are also excluded for most of this period, as are other uh, what we call today minority groups. And so you essentially have a rapidly growing cohort of white male physicians trained to, as I'll explain in more detail later, to see racial difference, trained to anatomize or treat racial differences as a kind of function of anatomy, and we'll study this. And another critical component to building this medical fraternity was that particularly in the Northeast, places like Penn, places like Harvard, and as well as a new medical school in the antebellum period, the Jefferson Medical College, also in Philadelphia, will directly seek out Southern students. Penn and Jefferson, at their peaks in the decades leading up to the Civil War, will be majority Southern. Harvard also sought but failed to attract Southern students. So what this means, though, is in trying to attract Southern students, medical schools create a, what I would call a slavery-friendly pedagogy. And so students across Northern and Southern communities will come together to learn a version of medicine that can be practiced on a plantation or in a bustling urban metropolis. And what this creates is a remarkably unified culture of medical practice that transcends region. And as sectional tensions will ratchet up throughout this period, the medical fraternity will remain remarkably unified. For example, we have, you know, the Missouri Compromise in 1820 will be the first kind of major sectional tension over slavery. Then the nullification crisis in the early 1830s, then the Compromise of 1850, bleeding Kansas. And historians have often focused on a small cohort of Southern physicians who in the late 1850s left Northern medical schools. But as I show in my book, more significant are the many who stayed, who did not think that learning medicine in the Northeast in any way indicated that they did not support slavery, but rather they viewed it as just going to the best medical school with a very slavery-friendly culture. And I should also note in this last decade, students started to discuss more and more a growing debate over the meaning of racial difference. And this would be whether or not the kind of racial difference emerged from a process called monogenesis or polygenesis. Monogenesis argued that all humans derive from a single species, it's basically Adam and Eve, and over time in distinct environments developed different racial groups. And this left the door open for kind of racial difference to be erased, uh, fictional racial differences, we should say, from hindsight. But polygenesis, on the other hand, argued that God created each different, you know, quote unquote, racial group as a separate species for a separate continent, a separate set of medical properties, we'll say, that we'll get into, uh, I'll, I'll probably unpack later. And these students began to discuss this in their medical student dissertations in local societies would have lectures on polygenesis, on monogenesis, and debates played out in medical journals about whether or not black and white people, and by extension, other groups like in this time, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, and generally speaking, East Asians is how they would have grouped them, whether or not they were also separate species. And in the last decade or so before the Civil War, and before we should note Darwin's discovery of natural selection or theorization of natural selection, polygenesis became the dominant understanding of racial difference in American medicine and in the American scientific community more broadly. So in short, to get back to what this medical fraternity was and did, so through this expansion and explosion of medical schools, you had a very large cohort, you know, tens of thousands of physicians who had experienced medical education in a remarkably similar way. This is something we can also see through correspondence between medical faculty or shared ideologies. So they experienced it in a mar remarkably similar way intellectually. Socially, they met their kind of peers in the Northeast, their cultural and scientific future elites, especially in places like Penn, Harvard, and Columbia. They met each other and formed lasting friendships through medical education. Many Southerners, went on to be medical faculty in the Northeast at places like Penn. 
And the final evidence of their tight bond is in the years immediately leading up to secession, actually, frankly, the months immediately leading up to following and during the secession crisis, physicians, elite physicians in particular in the North and the South, began exchanging a flurry of letters, making sure that they were remain friends throughout the impending civil war that they definitely saw as in the process of breaking out. And we also see the same thing happened after the civil war. These same physicians came back and said, for example, one doctor in Charleston, South Carolina, wrote to Joseph Leidy, who was the anatomy professor at Penn, a Philadelphia physician, one of the most prominent scientists of the second half of the 19th century, and said, Leidy, I rem remember your last letter. You said, the de if the union goes to the devil, we'll still be friends. I'm paraphrasing, but it's very close to that. And other letters started to come from Southerners complaining of Black people burning down their libraries. Can I get books sent from the Northeast? So the same fraternity that kept the medical profession remarkably unified as the rest of the country was in the process of fracturing was also critical for them sewing themselves back together so quickly or suturing, if we want to use medical language, suturing themselves back together in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War. When looking at the medical education offered to white men in the medical schools you describe in this period, how did the lives of Black people, their bodies, their illnesses figure in that education? That's a great question. And it's both an intellectual history, but also a social and material history of literally Black people's bodies became in many ways the content of medical education. So first and foremost, it's worth just quickly noting that whether it be in England in this period or the United States or France, dissection and anatomy were increasingly critical part of medical education. And this required, uh, at least from the physician's perspective, of course, this required several bodies a year. And in mass, we're talking about thousands of cadavers per year spread across medical schools in the United States, Europe, and abroad. And in places like the Deep South, this meant that Black people's bodies were the vast majority of dissection materials. And then in Northern cities, Black people's bodies were disproportionately represented in dissecting room because Technically speaking, anatomy, dissection, the procurement of cadavers outside of for executed criminals was illegal. There were no legal channels other than executed criminals for dissection materials. Throughout this period, uh, working class whites in particular also engaged in anatomy riots whenever their bodies were stolen. So there was real consequences, both potentially socially uh, and making medical schools look bad, but also physical violence that could come from stealing people's bodies. And so the more socially weak a group was, the more likely their bodies were to be preyed upon. And newspapers even publicly at times bragged about stealing Black people's bodies for dissection and really making synonymous the exploitation of Black people's bodies and anatomy and kind of naturalizing again a practice that was technically illegal, but socially acceptable when done on African-Americans. But we should also note that this was of critical importance and inspired resistance from the free Black population and potentially the enslaved population. In New York City, for example, we have evidence that at least in two cases in the late 18th century, Black New Yorkers took their bodies back, took two bodies back from medical schools because in a archaeological study of the African burial ground, they found bodies that had been partially anatomized. Likewise, a free African-American wrote an editorial in the 1780s, threatening medical students with death if they entered the Black burial grounds in New York City. Still, despite this evidence of resistance, we know with absolute certainty that Black people's bodies continue to be preyed upon. And we should also note that, of course, immigrants, working class whites, also suffered from body snatching, just not to the same proportion as poor Black people and enslaved people. Finally, worth noting is that Black New Yorkers experienced this as a spiritual attack on their communities. The burial ground evidenced remarkable consistency in burial practices, despite the fact that we know from the slave trade and studying that, 
that the actual kind of ethnic backgrounds of Africans coming into New York would have been remarkably diverse. So they were building a shared culture, and part of this was through internment. And so robbing their burial grounds was not just a kind of material attack on individuals, but also challenging their ability to kind of spiritually put at rest members of their communities. So if the medical schools rely so heavily on the bodies of Black people, what were the consequences of this for the production of medical knowledge? It's twofold. On the one hand, part of this dissection and culture of anatomy, part of it is to just improve anatomical knowledge. Another part is to create what we call clinical detachment. And so when you combine clinical detachment with disproportionate experimentation and study on a racialized minority, I would say it creates a culture of even deepening detachment from African Americans as patients, as medical subjects. In this period, we see disproportionate experimentation for surgical practices on enslaved people, uh, most notably J. Marion Sims, experimental gynecological surgeries uh, in Alabama, which will lead to the successful curing of vesicovaginal fistula, a terrible gynecological ailment. Even further, I found in my research that Students were conducting experiments that had no therapeutic value for medical practice. In one case, a student wanted to see if measles could be transmitted through the blood, uh, and he deliberately infected an enslaved person in South Carolina with measles. The case was terrible, the student explained. He feared that the man would die. Another student at the same, this is all, both students at the Medical College of South Carolina, induced nicotine toxicity on an enslaved mother and wanted to see if poison could be transmitted through breast milk and then forced her to suckle an enslaved child who also nearly died. And these students wrote about this in their medical student dissertations and, you know, by all accounts passed and did well in medical school. Uh, there's no evidence that this was even frowned upon. Uh, there's no evidence that it was necessarily encouraged either. I should be fair, but uh, it was certainly not discouraged. But more broadly, uh, our study of African-Americans' bodies in a kind of almost industrial setting, we should also note that that's what's happening more broadly in medicine, industrial study of disease uh, in a rapid pace. So you, in a place like Paris, where they have a large hospital system, physicians would be able to analyze, say, a thousand cholera cases and look across different sets of different bodies to see a kind of universal effects of cholera. And so that's the kind of mentality of looking at body after body is that you can see a kind of an average, even if it doesn't really exist, that's how it's created is through looking at body after body, taking measurements, averaging them together. Then you have a creation of a kind of anatomically and numerically proven set of racial differences. So this is another critical component that will be actually also integrated into the medical pedagogy. So for example, medical students will learn in their anatomy classroom that students were anatomically different in small and precise ways from head to toe. So some of these differences would be, you know, in smaller cases, arguing that black people have no arch in their foot compared to whites. Black people have longer forearms than white people. But most critically would be craniometry. And that is the measurement of the cranial capacity of people based on their race. So most critically here would be the work of Samuel Morton, who is also a medical professor at the Pennsylvania Medical College, a little competitor to the University of Pennsylvania next door. Um, and Morton collected more than a thousand human crania from around the world. His collection was called the American Golgotha after the graveyard of bodies in ancient Judea of people in Israel, Palestine today who were executed by the Roman government and their bodies laid there and their remains like emerged, you know, a skeleton. So Morton's huge collection is called this American Golgotha. And he makes measurements of people's bodies based on these five racial groups, Pacific Islanders, whites, Native Americans, generally speaking, East Asians, South Asians kind of migrate to different racial groups, depending on the um, racial theorist in the country and Africans. And he argues that white people have the largest cranial capacity and Africans have the smallest cranial capacity. And these are supposed to then correlate to brain weight. And the lightest brained Africans are the least intelligent, according to Morton. 
and the heaviest brained large cranial uh, Europeans are the most intelligent. And this is reinforced in textbooks. In the beginning of the 19th century, textbooks really don't talk about this stuff. But by the middle of the 19th century, anatomy textbooks are full of racial science, usually a couple pages at least on cranial measurements. It's also reinforced in lectures. And lectures, we should note, are not just a person standing at a podium reading something, but these are visually reinforced with artistic work behind them of racial difference. And then finally, in the anatomy museum itself, Harvard, for example, had a collection of 150, quote unquote, national skulls. Um, the national skulls were arranged by race, once again, meant to reinforce racial differences. And then finally, these, these codified racial groups were also meant to correlate to a set of health concerns that people of African descent in particular, not exclusively, might have. So medical students argued that Black people now coherently a separate group, potentially species, depending on one's ideology. Uh, they were coherently different through their anatomy, physicians argued in particular. Joseph Leidy at this point was arguing that speciesization should be defined by different anatomy. So these coherently different groups, supposedly biologically ordained, were then medicalized and their responses to diseases. Black people were supposed to be immune to yellow fever, malaria, and of you know, this is maybe not inherited, but also a kind of irony of dyspepsia or upset stomach, because they argued that this was caused by people who were lethargic. And since black people, of course, enslaved people were forced to work and were never lethargic, they were protected from everyday kind of upset stomach issues. And so in short, this use of bodies creates an extreme detachment, justifies a type of experimentation that Frankly, the only other case I found comparable in the Atlantic world resulted in loss of professional standing, legal charges, but had no consequences when done on enslaved people. And then the teaching that Black people had distinct anatomies, uh, were potentially a separate species, and reacted wholly differently to diseases common on plantations, which that's a critical part. All those diseases that they're supposedly immune from are also the ones that are most violently ravaging the Deep South in this period. What was the impact outside of clinical practice of the medical schools teaching about race and racial difference? Race does a lot of social work and creates a, a vision of reality in American life in a white supremacist society that naturalizes that white supremacist society. So first and foremost, we know during, through much of the history of slavery, if we zoom out past North America, the life expectancy of the average person once they get off a slave ship was a couple of years. Most people did not survive to have children. Health outcomes were horrific. Even in North America, where for much of the history of slavery, there was natural reproduction, which means that people live long enough to couple and have children. Oftentimes, that meant that still incredibly high infant mortality rates, where you might have to have six or seven children to naturally reproduce, which would mean the majority of your children died. Still, uh, so when we say that you know North America had a better health outcomes, it really is still horrifically bad health outcomes. We should always note, and also enslaved people. This shouldn't be a big surprise. Oftentimes, were not given very large quarters, living spaces. They lived in densely packed conditions where disease transmission would have been, in in many cases, almost. When we look at cholera outbreaks or during the pandemics of eighteen thirty three. In 1850, if cholera emerged on a plantation, it looked much like an urban epidemic, just on a very small scale, um, really rapid transmission, high death rates. So living in bad conditions. Yet after the invention of the cotton gin and the boom of slavery moving to the Southwest and a really what historians call the second slavery, the production of cotton will become one of the central kind of raw goods powering Western, we'll say broadly speaking, British, American expansion, economic growth. So slavery all of a sudden needs a justification to keep the cotton economy going. And, and I have a quote here from a student, actually, J.P. Bonner, who wrote in his thesis at the Medical College of the state of South Carolina. The thesis, this one was on malaria, but he says, noting in his thesis that enslaved people are protected from malaria, supposedly, of course, he said, Without the slaves' aid, the spindles and looms of Manchester, England, 
of Lowell, Massachusetts, and of all the large manufactories must in a great measure remain idle. The fertile plantations of the South and West must go uncultivated. So first and foremost, he's arguing in 1850 that slavery is central to economic development of the Atlantic world. Now, there is also, as we've mentioned, a really robust abolitionist movement criticizing slavery at every turn by 1850. And this is the beginning of the decade where the country really will fracture over a decade and be formalized in the secession crisis. Regionally visible political parties will emerge and the Republicans and the Democrats. You really have a fractional, sectionalized country for the last 10 years before the Civil War. So arguing that African-Americans don't experience these diseases are remarkably well suited to work in incredibly hot climates and humid climates. The subtropics are really an amorphous region, but it's, you know, adjacent to the tropics, which means it's maybe not as hot as the tropics, but still very hot. And so they make this case that their bodies actually make black people best suited for slavery, best suited for work, and that their quote unquote savagery, mental inferiority means that they'll also benefit from enslavement, from kind of a tutelage of whites. This is what somebody like the South Carolina politician John C. Calhoun coined as the positive good theory of slavery. That, you know, when Jefferson is still owns hundreds of people, but is claiming slavery is bad, by the late 1840s, Southerners following Calhoun, probably most important kind of pro-slavery politician, say that no, slavery is not a moral stain. Slavery is a positive good for society. And medicine makes it seem like a medical good. And in addition to that, how this will impact that broader framework, physicians will actually learn to behave in some ways almost like enslavers. For example, one student, Joseph Henson Mellichamp, also at the Medical College of South Carolina, said in 1852, that all the ills which the slave may casually suffer from tyranny and injustice do not have their impress upon him. In short, the kind of iconic corporal punishment of slavery, whippings, other forms of torture, they'll have enough impress to make the slave system run, but will not permanently scar enslaved people psychologically, just physically. In short, students can participate in the white supremacist corporal punishment system. And students, in some cases, we know, quite literally learned the terror tactics of plantation management. Uh, and this was in both the North and the South. One student in his thesis at the Medical College of South Carolina described an enslaved person complaining of having a concussion. And, and one of the fears of enslavers, and then by extension would be the fears of their physicians who worked for them when treating Black people on plantations, not for the enslaved themselves. But the student had to root out fake claims of illness for the fear that they were trying to get out of work. So this man who claimed of having a concussion, rather than being given rest, sustenance, uh, the best things you could get out of medicine in this period for the most part, he was whipped to prove whether or not he actually had a concussion. We'll never know if this was a tactic of resistance. Certainly enslaved people did that. But just as often, they had to calculate that even registering a real health issue like a concussion might have them physically abused. Another student, and this was in Philadelphia, noted a case where in Virginia, the plantation had an outbreak of, quote unquote, the chills. So some sort of probably respiratory illness, cold. And the enslaver, though, did not want to have a work stoppage for people to recover. And so he dug a grave adjacent to the field and said that the next person who complained of being sick would be buried alive. So quite literally, students are thinking about sometimes using the tactics of violent plantation management in their day-to-day -day, uh, life of managing slavery. And then finally, one of the things when I mentioned that American Golgotha, the skull collections of medical schools like Harvard, was that those came from the bodies of real people. And this is where we actually see if most medical schools, they're kind of tentacles of racism, exploitation of uh, subjugated populations, they're pretty local for the most part. Most of the bodies that medical schools got for their anatomy rooms came from their state, likely their surrounding communities. And in urban schools, most of the time they came from that city. But to create an international collection of racialized human remains, you needed to reach further. And this is one of the critical things I did when I was 
working on how to put some different voices in the book, or at least different stories in the book, to not necessarily break up, but illustrate the real life effects of this emergent white supremacist medicine on everyday people. And so in one chapter, as I'm analyzing the literal networks that span the globe to bring racialized crania to cities like Boston, to cities like Philadelphia, I also tell the stories of a couple of people whose bodies ended up in medical schools, um, in particular Harvard's medical school and the Warren Anatomical Museum. And so I wanna quickly just give uh, an account of, of one man or one, I, we should say, you know, youth uh, named Stormon. Stormon was a Khoi Khoi man born in Little Namaqualand in the mid 1840s. Little Namaqualand is a, a region of Southern Africa. It's approximately on the coastal uh, Atlantic coastal border of modern day Namibia and South Africa. Stormon's people historically were pastoralist cattle herders, but after more than a century of settler colonialism, uh, from first the Dutch, and then by this point, the British were in control. His community had been displaced from their traditional grazing lands and were really hunting and gathering and quite desperate, starving in many cases. So Stormon probably were you know, doing our best here around the age of 10, 12, in the middle of the 1850s, will somehow, likely on foot, get from the western coast of Southern Africa to the eastern coast in the Indian Ocean city of Natal. There, he'll lead white hunting parties before the British government will essentially rent him to an agent of P.T. Barnum, the famous showman and, of course, racialist showman. Stormon and four other men from Southern Africa, each representing different ethnic racial groups, will be displayed at Barnum's American Museum in New York, but for a more extended period of time in the Aquarial Gardens in Boston. Stormon will be forced to wear stereotypical native garb, sing songs and do supposedly stereotypical dances of his people. And this is in 1860 and 1861. So all simultaneous to the secession crisis and the start of the Civil War. And then in the late spring of 1861, we believe he was about 16 years old. This is what the reports say. Stormon hanged himself ritualistically, according to contemporaries in the fashion of his people, he assembled his belongings in a specific location in his room. and just took a tragic, final, potentially desperate shot at another existence, because uh, he did believe in an afterlife. That's where I think we can take a little solace as he, he was, to some degree, trying to wrest control of his life at every step, even, I think, his, his final death. But he did not get to control what happened with his body, of course. The Aquarial Gardens gave it to Harvard's medical school, or Harvard Medical Faculty, its final resting place, his skeleton, once his remains have been melted off with acid were given to the infamous polygenesis and Harvard professor, Louis Agassiz. Jeffries Wyman, who I also have a short chapter on the book in his kind of development as a racial thinker, wrote a pamphlet comparing Stormont's skeleton to gorillas, to other apes and whites, um, of course, showing him to be a sort of proto, or, you know, this is very early in the period of Darwin being uh, uh, the origin, the theory of natural selection being known, but a kind of proto missing link is how he's somewhat framed in that pamphlet. So in short, this racialized medicine in its kind of macro scale will say the slave system, which is under increasing attack from a politically divided country is natural, good, and healthy for the enslaved and abolishing it would be a detriment to them. Students learn terror tactics of plantation management, you know, frankly, how to be a violent white supremacist in a lot of ways. And then finally, the creation of this science, we should always, always remember, that was not neutral either. That was done on the bodies of people like Stormont, who somehow from Southern Africa ended up on display in Boston, and then still to this day, casts of his head remain in Harvard's Peabody Museum. And I'll say we're still, me and colleagues at Harvard are still looking for his skeleton and, you know, hoping to eventually find it and, and, you know, give him whatever peace academics and uh, his descendants can, can give. Well, these stories that you recount focus mainly on the mid to late 19th century. Are there continuing legacies in medical education of the stories you're telling? The book would be much happier if there weren't. But the, the sad uh, truth is, is that while there are changes and we should never treat history as kind of a, a series of total repetition, Racial medicine continues to plague medicine today, 
as it did um, the cohorts of physicians immediately following the Civil War. So, so part of that early question about the medical fraternity, I begin the afterward with those letters of physicians kind of sewing back together the medical fraternity that may appear to have been broken apart by the Civil War. And by the turn of the 20th century, it seems like almost a distant memory in the context of medicine. And there is a new racialized regime, but very much based on the antebellum one with many echoes. The, the engine of change, the engine of the creation of racial difference is Darwinian now, but the anatomical differences, the notions of different, different uh, immunities or susceptibility to different diseases remain the same in a lot of ways. So for example, during the Spanish-American War, the U.S. government will deliberately recruit Black women to serve as fever nurses in Cuba because of the high rates of yellow fever, arguing that they're immune to it. We still see a similar trend in the construction of the Panama Canal. Black workers and other workers of color are targeted to be constructing the Panama Canal under the notion that they'll be resistant to the kind of worst diseases of the tropics. And anybody, if you just do a quick assessment of the health outcomes of people working in the Panama Canal, similar to slavery, they're atrocious. There's no, no one would seriously look at that and say, these people were protected from those diseases. The death rates were very high. And then finally, we, we also see this kind of medicine being institutionalized at the turn of the 20th century in schools of tropical medicine, uh, notably the first being, you know, depending on who you listen to, either Tulane University School of Tropical Medicine or Harvard's T. Chan School of Public Health, I believe, is the kind of current version of it. But their School of Tropical Medicine, both are founded at the turn of the 20th century. Both are founded with the funding, heavy funding of people uh, at the kind of top of the United Fruit Company. So there is a very clear idea that we're training physicians to run the healthiest plantations we can run in places like Central America, places like Hawaii, uh, where there will be emergent sugar plantations in this period as well. And then for the European analogs in Britain, they're looking to employ tropical medicine in parts of India, China, Southeast Asia as well. So these ideas uh, will naturalize these new racialized labor regimes as healthy, even as, of course, they are not. So that's one kind of half. And then the other half is, so for the period of the book, much of it, medicine is really the uh, seat of an emergent field of anthropology. All of these racial theorists, you could, you could say, are both the founders of kind of eugenics, but also the founders of physical anthropology. And really anthropology, because cultural anthropology will break off from physical anthropology, which has an institutional home beforehand. And so as uh, scholars like Sam Redman have, have, have shown, skull collecting, people like Stormont's bodies, will the pace of their exchange around the world will increase after the Civil War, will increase after the scramble for Africa, will increase as footprints of Europeans in Southeast Asia, East Asia, and South Asia grow. So the racialization of human remains, their collection increases dramatically, and physical anthropologists will often be some of the loudest kind of proponents of a social Darwinistic competition among the races. Uh, and you can even see this sometimes in medical student writing in this period as well. So that's another critical component, even though they kind of split off into tropical medicine and anthropology, in many ways, the core arguments of polygenesis will persist and continue to have influence well after the abolition of slavery and, and well after the defeat, uh, frankly, of the polygenists. And that's a, another critical argument of the book is in some ways we focused too much on polygenesis as a kind of religious explanation for difference and not enough on its anatomical and medical explanations, which they will survive even as very few ser serious scientists are arguing that it's a debate over what natural selection or God creating differences. And then fast forward uh, past, of course, eugenics, ski syphilis experiments, many other things done to other racialized peoples in the 20th century into 2016. Uh, and this is where I kind of finally pick up in the book is there was a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. But the this study showed that was a study uh, of kind of surveying UVA medical students and residents and asking them first, 
did they believe any, uh, would say, medical racial stereotypes that frankly date back from the slavery period? And it showed that students still believed, not all of them, but some of them, believed that Black people had thicker skin, smaller brains, denser bones, aged more slowly, and had less sensitive nerve endings. And this, again, this kind of anatomical knowledge or anatomical stereotypes were shown to also inform how physicians treated Black patients. Specifically, physicians who believed uh, these, these stereotypes were more likely to prescribe less pain medication for Black patients and prescribe you know, just different and always less amounts of pain medicine, uh, which also is a stereotype that certainly goes back to the period of slavery. Some scholars have argued that it's a, a kind of analysis of enslaved women who culturally tried not to show pain during childbirth that was kind of morphed into a broader ideology. But one medical student in the 1850s said you could amputate an enslaved patient's arm and they wouldn't issue a whimper, but they'd bleed out on your table. So they'd experience no pain, but they would experience the other health effects of having your arm cut off. And these racial stereotypes, what they do is rationalize an unequal healthcare and broader social system that has real health repercussions. So for example, we look at, there have been many countless articles in the supposed genetic causes of higher rates of asthma amongst Black children. And there haven't been a specific gene ever isolated. There's no concrete piece of evidence. It's just correlation that, uh, or just really at this point, theorization. But what that does us, when we look at things as genetics, we don't ask what social and environmental determinant might also be causing, or more likely just is causing these unequal health outcomes. That same issue, scholars of African-American history know well that in the mid 20th century, as the American infrastructure was being built, all the major interstates in going through major cities were put through, if there was a black population, which many most cities did have one, the interstate would go through their neighborhood. So they're being exposed to much more pollution. There are other very many other kind of environmental pollutants that are more likely in poor communities, disproportionately African-American. Another example would be in the Pima Indians in the Southwest. In the early 20th century, they sourced all their food from their own agriculture, had remarkably low rates of diabetes. But in the last 50, 60 years, their rates of diabetes have skyrocketed. Now, in the time being, the U.S. appropriated some of their land, particularly their agricultural land and the water source that allowed them to be an agriculturally sustained society. And they went on government-supplied industrial food rations. Rates of diabetes skyrocketed, and physicians often, more often looked for things like a thrifty gene that would cause this rather than a fundamental shift in the type of food and the health of that food taken in. So all of this racial medicine says that A, these different outcomes are natural. They're literally you know, biological in nature. Second, it sets the solutions as primarily technological. We need to find the best medication to treat the genes that we need to find that make the Pima Indians more likely to have diabetes, Black people more likely to have hypertension. And uh, rather than try and treat the social and environmental conditions that light more, much more likely are caught and are actually mappable and visible through scientific methods, but are causing these disparities. So, so that's why at the end of the book, I argue for two things is we need a universal healthcare system that says that we don't need to rationalize disparities in the providing of healthcare because they wouldn't exist in a universal system. There might be some, but those can be dealt with because they're not meeting the goal of the system. Second, we need to abolish the use of racial categories in medicine at least as a biological factor. We'll have to use these categories some to chart inequality. So I'm not advocating for a pure kind of race-blind medicine, but we need to treat race as a social indicator and use racial categories to map social disparities, not map theorized genetic ones that there are very frankly, very poor evidence to support. Um, so that's where the sad repetition uh, is, is that in many ways, this 
racial medicine of today is doing the exact same type of work that was done to rationalize slavery. But the answer is, is fairly simple. We need to move away from racially essentializing patients, and we need to move towards an equal system for everyone. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Chris, for sharing your work and your perspectives with us. Well, we've clearly just scratched the surface of the book. Christopher Willoughby's book is Masters of Health, Racial Science and Slavery in U.S. Medical Schools, published by the University of North Carolina Press. You can find more resources for exploring this topic, as well as others, at www.chstm.org. This has been a podcast from the Consortium for History of Science, Technology, and Medicine.